This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Next Wednesday marks 50 years since the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. This moment has historians, scholars, and others asking, where do we go from here? Coming up, we talk about race relations in America with UConn history professor Dr. Jeffrey Ogbar. Do you remember the day Dr. King was assassinated? What stands out to you when we look back at his legacy and the civil rights movement? That conversation later. First, National Geographic magazine has focused its entire April issue on race. Its editor-in-chief, Susan Goldberg, writes that coverage over the publication's 130-year history was often racist. Next month's special issue gives the magazine a chance to reconcile with its past and focus on efforts to accurately cover diverse people around the world. At the same time, National Geographic is credited with giving Americans and others a picture of the world long before traveling to exotic locales was possible or acceptable. Yet these glimpses into cultures many knew nothing about was limited because they were told from the perspective of white men taking the photographs and writing the stories. Now, do you subscribe to National Geographic? What's your reaction to the magazine acknowledging its past? You can join the conversation today, 860-275-7266. You can email where we live at WNPR.org, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I want to welcome to the show, uh, on the phone with us, Dr. Catherine Lutz, professor of anthropology at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And back in 1993, she co-authored the book Reading National Geographic. Um, Catherine, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Lucy. Uh, we've been there's been a lot of coverage about what National Geographic has done with this special uh, April issue. Um, when you read uh, the magazine at the, at the front of it, uh, the editor in chief Susan Goldberg writes that to rise above the racism of the past, we must acknowledge it. And it's the first time this particular magazine has looked back at its coverage again over more than a century and talked about um, this very narrow lens uh, that it provided its readers. What's your reaction uh, to what they have done? Well, I think it's uh, very, very late in the day for the Geographic to have acknowledged what um, their magazine did through so many years, which was to present a very uh, distorted lens um, uh, about um, people of color for a mainly white audience. You said the the producers are mainly white males. The, The readers for many, many years were overwhelmingly uh, white families, and uh, and I think what they are trying to do is is good. I mean, in the sense that uh, we need to think about every American institution's relationship to uh, to racism, whether it's the police or our, our government. But um, I think it's very very late in the day. Um, we wrote our book 25 years ago uh, and looked at uh, the the kind of racial codes that were in the magazine and. There were those earlier, very ugly colonial era uh, racial ideas, uh, ugly and lazy people. Uh, but I think there was a more, uh, and, and they acknowledged that in the apology. But more recently, uh, for for many decades uh, in the post-colonial era, the the pictures have other problems, um, which are also feeding into uh, the idea of of a natural racial inequality. Mm-hmm. You mentioned your book that you co-authored with Jane Collins. Again, it's called uh, Reading National Geographic. And I'm curious why you uh, decided to uh, write that book back in the 90s. And what was National Geographic's uh, reaction to it? Well, we wanted to write it after beginning to teach at a a large state university where our students um, already had, we thought they were coming to our introduction to anthropology classes with with, um, without much knowledge of the rest of the world, but they actually had most of them encountered a view of the world, um, an exotic, uh, smiling view of, of not people of color around the world from the National Geographic magazine, we assumed, mainly. Um, so we, we were interested in, in how they um, came to that idea, what they were learning from the magazine. We also were in the, the college pub uh, when the United States invaded Grenada and students cheered, and we also wanted to understand how, how had the National Geographic's uh, positive, uh, uh, sort of rosy glass view of the of the world not prevented um, that kind of hostility uh, towards uh, towards people who um, were being attacked at that at that time. 
What about your relationship to the magazine? I mentioned uh, so for so long, uh, this was a magazine that offered uh, people, especially in this country, a glimpse into uh, the big world out there. I mentioned you're an anthropologist. I'm curious, uh, uh, growing up, what was your relationship with the magazine? Oh, I'm I'm white. I grew up in an all white suburb um, in, in New Jersey, and the magazine came in as a kind of invitation to understand the rest of the world as a as again a comfortable exciting place um so yeah in in some ways that was one of the roots of of wanting to do anthropology but it led me to a pretty distorted view of what was what what was out there um again a this notion of the family of man that the photographs um, were presenting um seems innocent and 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 uh but it but in fact it's it's presenting us with a view of of um that doesn't have any history. The, the the people in those photographs had no no history presented to us. They were just typical folks from Af- an African country, let's say. Uh, they they weren't really uh, in charge of their own future, um, and there was no conflict uh, between the United States and those countries that could explain uh, when the magazine vi- finally did show some more difficult images of hunger and poverty. Um, there was really n- nothing that the magazine had helped people do to understand the, 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 the kinds of exploitation and other uh, historical patterns that had resulted in those um, difficult situations that people were in. When did there begin to be a shift, not only in how uh, National Geographic was covering these stories, again, looking at conflict and not just the pretty pictures, so to speak, but uh, uh, Susan Goldberg, again, the editor-in-chief, mentions that, you know, even uh, in the 70s, the magazine was ignoring the people of color in this particular nation and uh, the challenges and uh, struggles that were going on. I'm just curious when they started to shift um, from, again, when they first were founded back in 1888? Well, we noticed uh, uh, some sharp differences in the late 60s and early 70s when we did a, a close analysis of hundreds of the photographs. Uh, in particular, I think the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement began to suggest that the story was not so simple. Uh, other media were beginning to cover uh, those conflicts um, that were um, they, were, they were going on, and, and some of the, uh, these more uh, offensive images of, for example, uh, white explorers showing a camera to a, a local uh, a person in Ghana and having the person look mesmerized and childlike, um, those images uh, disappear. Images of po- uh, white ex- uh, explorers being carried across a, a river by black porters that, in New Guinea, that disappears. So those those images of, of a white person in a in a in a world of of people of color that come to be feel come to feel I think more uncomfortable for a white audience and the geographic response to that um, in in again the, the late sixties early seventies. On the phone with me is Dr. Catherine Lutz, professor of anthropology at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Uh, we're talking today on where we live about this latest issue of National Geographic magazine. They focused the entire issue of April, a special issue on uh, the topic of race. And in it, uh, National Geographic uh, reckons with its uh, racist history, the way that they covered uh, many different cultures and stories uh, from the time that the magazine started started back in 1888. Now, if you subscribe to National Geographic, we want to hear from you about uh, this acknowledgement. Uh, what does it mean uh, to you as someone who has uh, looked through the magazine, maybe grew up like many of us, uh, uh, leafing through the pages? You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. Uh, Catherine, before we bring in another guest, I did want to ask um, National Geographic uh, was, I guess, influenced uh, 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 from ideas throughout society and academia, including in your own discipline, anthropology. You know, how how was its coverage shaped by ideas in science at the turn of the century? Well, yes, I think uh, scientific racism uh, was the was uh, ubiquitous uh, at at that time, and and, uh, the discipline of anthropology came to challenge it. Over time, but I think uh, more generally, again, the the kinds of uh, photographs that they were publishing, uh, even when they began to show uh, racial inequality and confront that notion, uh, 
uh, they they came back and they still come back to smiles. That, that this notion that everything will be okay, um, and I think that's um, that's important to to realize that the photograph, even where they to have a more critical photographic style, um, p- the people who read those photographs, who see those photographs, uh, are going to interpret them. They're often ambiguous, and they're going to insert their own racial politics into those photos um, in ways that we have to confront as well. I wanted to bring into the discussion now Lauren Jackson. Uh, She's a freelance writer and Ph.D. candidate in English at the University of Chicago. She wrote a piece about the National Geographic's race issue for New York Magazine's Daily Intelligencer. Uh, Lauren, welcome to the show. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So what's your reaction? Again, you wrote a a, a lengthy piece about uh, um, this magazine, National Geographic, uh, acknowledging uh, its past history and the way it it, uh, covered stories and um, offered glimpses into cultures, not a lot of context, but uh, the beautiful pictures, uh, again, told from very narrow lens. What is your reaction to what they have done with this special issue? Well, just to add on to what Catherine's already mentioned, um, yeah, I think, you know, on its face, it's very admirable for a publication to really reckon with its history so publicly and to say, you know, in, you know, strong words, our coverage was racist. And so as a project, I think that's really cool. I think that's something that I think a lot of publications could actually take a leaf from. Um, But I'm also, you know, a little bit, you know, concerned not just with, you know, the kind of looking at the past coverage, but to actually consider, okay, what is this future coverage of race going to look like? And, you know, we're presented with this cover story about these, you know, biracial twins. And it, you know, I was just looking over it and it really seems to pick up, you know, a lot of present mythology that we have about race. And it's, you know, a little bit concerning that, you know, as the the race issue, as the issue that says it's going to, you know, from henceforth, um, you know, tackle race in a kind of rigorous way to kind of leave us with this story that is kind of dwelling with a lot of, um, I guess, mythology, a lot of mm-hmm. fictions about race that are kind of persistent in the contemporary. Let's describe the cover to listeners who may not have uh, picked up this issue. Um, again, it's a, a picture of twins, as you mentioned. Uh, one girl lighter skinned than the other. Her hair is lighter than the other, but they are twin sisters. And they, uh, the uh, text on the cover says, black and white. These twin sisters make us rethink everything we know about race. So, so go a little go a little more into, uh, Lauren, um, some of the, the issues you take with this kind of, I guess, clickbaity type of, of cover uh, picture. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very, you know, sensational. You know, they're twins. You know, the, you know, very, <laughs> you know, the font, you know, black and white. And, you know, one twin is obviously visibly lighter. One is visibly darker. They're both from the same parents. So it's the kind of story that, you know, does attract uh, a reader, you know, for the sensationalism of it. And the story, I mean, what the story is trying to do is to pick at, you know, the fact that biologically, you know, race does not really exist. You know, the twins have black and white parents. You know, they came out with these different phenotypes. That doesn't mean, you know, they're still related. They're still from the same parents. One is, you know, a visibly black child. The other child, I still say, is looks kind of visibly, you know, quote unquote mixed or visibly black. But, you know, as according to, you know, the way the cover is set up, she's supposed to look, you know, very quote unquote white. And so what this is supposed to, you know, demonstrate for us is that, yeah, race is a fiction. Um, but what the story doesn't actually try to delve into is, you know, why is race a fiction? Why do we hold on to it if, you know, biologically it does not exist? You know, it doesn't exist. You know, it's a social construct, right? And, you know, Goldberg does mention that in her editor's note, but she also doesn't, you know, question, okay, if it's a fiction, why do we hold on to fiction? Mm-hmm. You know, we have a lot of fictions in society that we like to believe and that we hold on to very, very strongly for very, very strong reasons. And instead of, you know, probing that, you know, this piece acts as if, you know, this revelation is, you know, 
going to be the thing that, you know, cracks open racism in society and, you know, after this issue we can all, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya or something like that. When, you know, actually, you know, critical race theorists have been talking about race as a fiction for 20, 30 years or more. And, you know, the nugget that makes racism so hard to crack is the re- is essentially the kind of emotional value we tie to it. Mm-hmm. And instead of opening that up, the story kind of uses the twins to, you know, garner a kind of sentimental, um, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like, you know, you should always be proud of what you look like, which, mm-hmm. you know, is all fine and well, but doesn't really hold up to the idea that this issue is going to, you know, really get down to the bottom of race and racism in society. So you're talking about suggesting this post-racial optimism, uh, so to speak, uh, because these two girls are featured on the cover and the story doesn't go into a lot of the, like you mentioned, the the difficult uh, topics of race, but more on how uh, they seem to have a great life in the UK. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, pull quotes from the children that say, you know, they've never dealt with racism, which is on one hand hard to believe, but also, I mean, it's coming from the mouth of an 11-year-old. So, you know, that's their world and that's their worldview, but it also doesn't really uh, kind of address the, the social component again. This is where we live. Again, on the phone with me, Lauren Jackson, a freelance, freelance writer, rather, who has written about uh, National Geographic's uh, decision to devote its uh, April issue to race. Uh, and also on the phone, Dr. Catherine Lutz uh, from Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Uh, you know, I wanted to go back to you, uh, Dr. Lutz, if we could uh, talk a little bit about where does National Geographic go from here? Um, you had written about um, social evolutionism and how the National Geographic gets perpetuated that. Can you describe that for us and just next steps on, on again, they're acknowledging their pa- past, but where can they go now? Well, I I think, as, as Lauren said, there's this post-racial optimism in the new issue, which suggests that that idea that was so common in the magazine uh, over, the, over the decades, this idea that people were evolving slowly to look like uh, white America, um, um, not in their physical being, of course, but in their social world, right, that this idea that uh, people really had no local future. They were going to become like us um, over time, and uh, they weren't being, uh, they weren't speaking, they weren't named, they they didn't have, uh, again, a, a, a separate set of interests and and goals that we needed to understand, uh, which might result in a different future. Mm. Um, so I I think that that's a, it's a really crucial set of ideas that are still out there in, in the culture at large. And, and I think where the geographic needs to go is, is in recognizing and, and showing how a photograph can be interpreted in many different ways. And that if there is racism and racial inequality in America, there will be uh, whatever their photographs uh, or many types of photographs that they could publish will feed into and then reinforce um, some of the biases and and um, uh, of the of the readership, and they need to confront that as well. Lauren, do you see other institutions, other publications, uh, uh, taking a, a lesson from what National Geographic is doing? Um, I think in you know the wake of you know this past fall and you know all the information that's been you know kind of revealed in you know the hashtag Me Too, Me Too movement. I think a lot of publications, you know, have in a way, you know, maybe not as, um, you know, plainly put as National Geographic has, but I do think a lot of publications have been trying to kind of reevaluate, you know, the way that they, you know, cover issues of, you know, race, gender, sexuality, and things like that. And, um, yeah, I definitely see it. I think it's a slow, it's kind of like a slow change. Um, I think the more that, you know, journalists and editors can engage with, um, you know, the humanities, with researchers, with people who have been thinking about this for, you know, a lot longer than, you know, an issue or, uh, you know, a season, um, the better, basically. And we should note, um, 
oftentimes, especially even in our newsroom, we talk about uh, the right ways to cover our communities. And uh, we hear about this after uh, the election in many newsrooms, not reflecting the diversity of our nation. Uh, we're not just talking about skin color, but socioeconomic factors and where people come from. It's very important to have a, a varied uh, staff uh, to, to, to cover these communities as accurately as possible. And so it gets the juries out if uh, enough is being done um, in that realm. But I want to thank Lauren Jackson again, freelance writer, PhD candidate in English at the University of Chicago. We're going to tweet out a link to the piece uh, she wrote about National Geographic's race issue for New York Magazine. Lauren, thank you so much. Thank you. Also, thanks to Catherine Lutz, Dr. Catherine Lutz, professor of anthropology at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. She co-authored the book Reading National Geographic back in 1993. Uh, Dr. Lutz, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, what is race anyway? We'll talk about the way scientists have shaped the concept of race, and we want to hear from you, too. That's after the break, 860-275-7266. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. If race is a made-up concept, why is it so hard for society to let it go? In the latest issue of National Geographic, the magazine confronts its racist past with several articles, including one that explores how race became a defining marker to highlight differences between groups of people around the globe. What was science's role in perpetuating the idea that race was a legitimate way to categorize people? And does it make sense for scientists to use race today as a way to continue to study groups of people? You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, wel- I want to welcome to Where We Live now on the phone with us Dr. Michael Udell, Associate Professor at Drexel University's School of Public Health, Chair of the Department of Community Health and Prevention, also author of the book Race Unmasked, Biology and Race in the 20th Century. Dr. Udell, welcome to the show. Good morning. Uh, You co-authored a paper in the journal Science titled Taking Race Out of Human Genetics. Um, Before we get into why you and your your, um, uh, fellow researchers uh, don't think race is a meaningful biological category that uh, researchers should continue to use, we want to get a little history about how race has been viewed in the context of science and um, how that thinking um, helped contribute to the way magazines like National Geographic uh, portrayed this racial hierarchy. Can you give us a little history? On, on where these ideas first came from. Sure, and uh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the race concept has uh, been a point of contention in natural and social scientific thought for more than a century. Um, the idea that we can divide and classify humans uh, by uh, generally broad continental groups um, has been a tool for scientific analysis, uh, you know, dating back to the mid 19th century with the emergence of uh, anthropological thinking in the United States, particularly the work of Dr. Samuel Morton, who believed that by studying human skulls, he could classify humans from white to uh, African um, in a hierarchy of skull size, which directly related in his view, uh, his mistaken view, to intelligence. He believed that the cranial capacity of skulls was indicative of different intelligence levels between groups. Uh, In the late 19th, early 20th century, um, with the rise of eugenics and the belief that uh, different races uh, had very specific traits associated with them, both health-related and social and intellectual traits, Um, was a very powerful force in not only American society, but throughout Europe and in other parts of the globe. Um, But what's interesting is that around this time, we see the first uh, critiques of the idea that humans could be divided up pretty simply by continent, um, and critiques that those divisions reflected some sort of, some some innate characteristics um, or traits that were associated with those groups. And W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who <clears throat> we generally think of as a great civil rights leader in the first half of the 20th century, as a founder of the NAACP, for example, was also a, 
very important sociologist. Uh, he was the first African American to graduate with a PhD from Harvard, um, and went on uh, to do a, a really important study in the late 1890s in Philadelphia. Um, and he published a book about that called The Philadelphia Negro, in which he began an argument that he made over the course of his career that uh, race was not simply a biolog biological phenomenon, but reflected deep historical, social, and cultural factors um, that related to differential outcomes between populations of people. Um, we have been struggling with Du Bois's vision for more than a century now. And Du Bois, instead of seeing race as uh, accounting for differences between groups, believed that social conditions uh, largely accounted for those. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who was a leading evolutionary biologist at the time, um, rethought the way in which race was utilized in modern genetics and evolutionary thinking, and did so to push back against these eugenic ideas that I mentioned earlier, that there were these simple types of peoples and populations that could be easily characterized. Um, but Dobzhansky thought that he could use race as a method, and he recognized that race was not hierarchical, that race was a way to measure differences between populations. Um, and for him, there could be one race where there could be many races. Um, race didn't follow the usual white-black um, and other group trajectory that we tend to think of race still to this day. Um, and Dubjansky stood by his thinking for a couple of decades, but in the late 1950s and early 1960s, as he saw the civil rights movement rise, as he had some pretty intense disagreements with his colleagues about the nature of race and racial differences. He called for genetics and evolutionary biologists to rethink the way in which scientists thought about human difference and the way they characterized human difference, because he came to realize that the social and scientific ways people thought about race were ultimately inseparable, and that science was a social endeavor too, and that, you know, considering the, the use of racial groups in science would always be sullied by broader social thinking about race and racial groups. Mm. Um, Dr. Udell, I, I didn't want to, mean, I don't want to run out of time, but if race isn't a good proxy, what's a better way to study people? So in our paper in Science uh, that was published a few years ago, we argue two things. One, we argue that uh, scientists should be thinking about other categories like ancestry and population to look at you know differences between groups of people we recognize that you know population geneticists study human populations and look at the frequency of traits between those populations that vary between groups um, race is not a good proxy for understanding the way in which those traits vary um, looking more closely at smaller population groups or ancestry, which is a process-based concept which understands one's genomic heritage or genetic heritage, um, essentially the sum of who we are and the genes that make us who we are, rather than race, which is a pattern-based concept where we are either assigned or assumed to be in one racial group or another. We believe that's the path forward. But what we've proposed in our paper and the work that we've been doing since is that we are calling for the National Institutes of Health and the National Academies of Science to come together to bring uh, social and natural scientists together for you know, a, a, a consensus study to help geneticists and social scientists think about how to use categories uh, for classifying difference in a way that's clear and consistent and doesn't um, Recapitulate uh, mm -hmm. these old and outdated categories of difference that is the race concept. I believe your paper was published back in 2016. What has been the pushback? So, you know, it, it, things have moved along, but slowly. There was a meeting at NIH in the fall of 2016 to discuss what could be done, and there were some interesting ideas that came out of that meeting, including um, pushing the National Institutes of Health to include social determinants data, um, that is non-racial data, 
um, things like education level, zip code, other variables that sh- that influence health um, in during during the lifespan, and having NIH include that in what's called the enrollment inclusion form, which is part of you know what uh, data needs to be collected as part of NIH studies. We also discuss the ways in which electronic medical records can push back against this simple racial or population-based idea of what health and difference is, um, and use electronic medical records to look at the environmental um, and other health-related uh, outcomes and impacts during one's lifespan to make the study of human health and human difference much more robust in terms of the data we collect uh, or the data that scientists have access to when studying these differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit again. Uh, we know about the Human Genome Project uh, back in the early 2000s, identifying and mapping all of our genes. How did that project and what it found out about the relationship between genetics and race impact uh, this conversation we're having today? So what's interesting about that moment um, in the early 2000s was that uh, two, two things were going on. One, folks like me, social scientists and ethicists, were very concerned about the way in which the Genome Project could help us slide uh, or, 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 you know, provide a, 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 a new science that could slide back into simplistic and eugenic thinking about difference and about health. Um, the other thing that happened was that scientists, uh, many scientists, not all, including Craig Venter, who was then uh, president of Solera Genomics, uh, one of the two leaders in genomic research at the time, and Francis Collins, who's now head of the National Institutes of Health, but was then head of the National Human Genome Research Institute, both of them were very clear in saying that race is not a scientific concept and is a poor proxy for understanding the relationship between humans and their genes. Um, But what's happened since is that we've actually seen a significant increase in the use of race as a classificatory tool in scientific study. And I think what's happened is, is that scientists are really looking to solve uh, the challenges, particularly around health disparities, that are real. But geneticists, you know, have tools that relate to genes, and they're not necessarily looking at the broader, you know, social and environmental impacts of health, that, that impact health, and we need to help them do that. And I think that that's why it's so important that the National Institutes of Health and the National Academies of Scientists help geneticists and other scientists today have tools at, you know, at their fingertips to do this in a better way that doesn't recapitulate these you know, old and outdated ideas of racial difference. Dr. Michael Udell is Associate Professor at Drexel University School of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Community Health and Prevention. He's author of the book Race Unmasked, Biology and Race in the 20th Century. Uh, Thank you so much for your perspective. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Finally, we're going to reflect on next Wednesday. April 4th marks 50 years since Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Now, race is still a contentious issue today in America, even though we know it's a made-up concept. As Martin Luther King Jr. asked in his final book, where do we go from here? We want to hear from you. 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, before Women's History Month draws to a close, we'll draw your attention to a Connecticut native who was involved in the civil rights movement, Constance Baker Motley. On the next Where We Live, we'll look at Motley's lasting impact as an African-American lawyer, politician, and judge. Now, today we've been talking about race this hour. Now, racial equality was at the root of the civil rights movement in America. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the movement's most notable leaders. He was killed April 4th, 1968. Now, do you remember the day he was assassinated? Have your family members talked about that moment in history? Have you thought about Dr. King's legacy today? We want to hear from you. Join the conversation, 860-275-7266. I want to welcome to the show, in studio with me now, Dr. Jeffrey Ogbar, 
our professor of history at the University of Connecticut. Thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we're, we're talking about this uh, today um, in, a, in an hour where we're talking about race, but we know next Wednesday is uh, 50 years since the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, you're probably too young to remember that, but tell me what your relatives have mentioned about that time. So, yes, I was, I was born a year after uh, uh, Dr. King's assassination, but my parents were, were married in 67 and uh, newlyweds in Chicago. And my mother tells a story that they, were, uh, they went out to dinner on April 4th, uh, and they were coming out, and they were having a leisurely stroll through the streets of, of Chicago, and they saw someone who, whom they didn't know who was distraught and stopped them and told them that Dr. King had been assassinated. And my mother said that she immediately started to cry. My my father comforted her, uh, comforted her. And so that was uh, her experience. And my father had come out of the military. He was in the, the Air Force for some years. Uh, he was born and bred in Chicago, uh, went to California. He was in Northern California where he was stationed. And, uh, and he served during Vietnam. And he, he t- later told me that he left tanks and guns and military to come home to tanks and guns and military uh, in his streets. Uh, so uh, as a child hearing these stories, when I say coming home to tanks and military is because uh, Chicago, like many cities across the United States, there were uh, cases of urban unrest. So over 125 cities um, exploded, Hartford among them. And so there were uh, places where uh, National Guard, of course, had, was called out and uh, Washington, D.C. was uh, you know, on, on fire and so on. And so, so these are some of the things. And uh, so I did hear stories. Uh, and, and later, as a professionally trained historian who studies this period, I would reflect on some of these stories in ways I didn't quite as a child, you know, and they sort of have greater meaning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, in school, we learn specific things about Dr. King, including his I Have a Dream speech. But remind us what was happening in 1968, why he was in Memphis, and how uh, his campaign for racial equality was uh, starting to be more broad in the terms of, of social justice and looking at poverty uh, in America from people of all colors. Yeah, so uh, Dr. King was in Memphis to assist with the sanitation worker strike. Uh, the uh, there were black sanitation workers who were not only being paid an incredibly paltry salary, but exposed to dangerous conditions, not allowed to just be inside a building when it's raining, for example, uh, and being forced under to work under you know very uh, ins- uh, dangerous conditions and, and unhealthy conditions with very very low pay. So it was part of a larger campaign that was geared towards uh, addressing poverty. So in 1964, at uh, President Johnson's first State of the Union address, he meant he declared this war on poverty. And so it wasn't something that was solely an uh, attention of King, but there were many people, in fact, people into the civil rights movement who had for years argued that uh, that they had to bring attention to the, the forces of class and that there were some black folks who once restaurants and hotels were open to them could could go. But there were many who could not go. Uh, whether it was legally open to them or not because of of poverty. And if they didn't address these things, that this would be a very unequal unfolding of freedom. So this became a a, a more central piece, particularly after the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, where people could attend restaurants, go go to restaurants and hotels. uh, But again, huge swaths of the community economically would still be unable to, to, to go. And so these became issues in those four years after the Civil Rights Act. And what about how um, his message of nonviolent protest, how that was either uh, being uh, dismissed at the time because uh, there was frustrations um, and the rise of the black nationalist movement. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So uh, there, there had always been a tension within the black freedom struggle, I, I would say, in the modern civil rights movement from you know the post-war period, that there were many African-Americans who felt that moral suasion, this argument that the collective white community would do good because it's morally right, right? That we can convince them. And that in the face of violent hostility, including, you know, beatings, murder, torture, imprisonment, uh, assassinations, all sorts of legal and extra legal forces that um, that were, were used against those freedom fighters, that somehow that you could appeal to them on a moral level and that turning the other cheek and, you know, not uh, defending yourself with uh, like like physical defense, that that would be effective. And there are many people who became very tired and critical of that. 
And that, that segment grew as years um, went on. But that had always been part of the discussion for years within the civil rights movement. But it became more acute certainly after um, uh, 1966 and the, the, the rise of the black power movement. And so many organizations, the Black Panther Party among them, argued that African Americans had a right to, and anyone, in fact, had a right to defend themselves against terrorist attack. Uh, and, and so this conspicuous display of black militancy was very acute uh, and became very visible in 1968. But after King's assassination, it really exploded. I mean, the Black Panther Party itself was a small regional organization confined to California in the start of 1968. In fact, it was a, an organization that was one of scores of small little local groups that people may have not have heard of, may not have heard of, uh, had it not been for the Free Huey campaign that really, uh, Huey Newton was a co-founder who was arrested for uh, killing a police officer, but this Free Huey campaign that emerged in uh, really fall of 67 and the beginning of 68. But it was King's assassination that accelerated the growth of the Black Panther Party. And so while there are scores of little small local groups, the uh, the sort of anger and outrage that here we have the the greatest apostle of nonviolence, and even he, you know, fell victim to this superstructure of, of uh, sort of violence that that there had to be another another way for some people. Yeah. In studio with me, Dr. Jeffrey Ogbar, professor of history at University of Connecticut, as we re- reflect on 50 years next Wednesday since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I asked listeners earlier if uh, they remember the day uh, that he was assassinated. Have they thought about his legacy 50 years on and and the discussions of race today in our nation? You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. I want to welcome a listener call. Mark is calling from Wyndham. Mark, go ahead. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, when I was uh, in first grade, I lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My mother was a teacher at Winston-Salem State, and um, which is a traditionally black college. She, we are white, and um, when uh, I was in that in first grade, uh, Martin Luther King came to Winston-Salem to speak at a church there, and my parents brought me and my sister uh, to the church to listen to him speak it was so full that we had to go down into the basement and listen through speakers in the sunday school classrooms but my dad took us up one at a time and held us up behind the pulpit and showed us martin luther king and said you need to remember this person he's going to be a famous man someday and then fast forward to when he was shot i was sitting in my parents uh, bedroom watching TV there, and it came over the news that he was shot, and it was very distressing to me because over that time I remembered him and heard him on the news, and you know I thought of him as this is my Martin Luther King who shot my Martin Luther King. I was probably uh, 11 or 12 at that time, and so I just wanted to share that story with you. Thank you, Mark, uh, for calling in today. Um, obviously, a lot of motion from many people when they, they think about um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and what he stood for and, and how uh, his life was ended in this way. Um, this is, I guess, too big of a question with only a few minutes left to go in our show, um, Jeffrey. But when we look at race relations today and we look at uh, Dr. King's legacy, you know, where I'm just curious what your opinion is of the conversations we're having uh, in these recent um, months and what you think Dr. King would have thought about uh, the conversations we're still having in 2018 about race. So I think that in many ways King would be um, pleased and in many ways disappointed. You know, so uh, we have a very unfold, uh, uneven unfolding of freedom. Just historically, uh, it's not, sort of not an easy linear process, whether we're looking at race, class, gender, ethnicity, in all sorts of ways. And I think that there's no way you get around the fact that there was there there have been these in- incredibly um, important and meaningful strides. Right when you look at the declines of everything. So for mortality rates, uh, increases in life expectancy, increases in high school graduation rates, and um, actually decreases of poverty rates and so on. So in the beginning of 1960, uh, the majority, over half of African Americans were in, in poverty. Now we have a historic low of 22%. So you, you have those sorts of differences. But you also have um, you know mass incarceration, which is something that is the I would argue uh, perhaps the, the the greatest moral dilemma that we have, in the, uh, along with health, not having health care for all citizens. We're talking about life here, with uh, from 
babies being born and the protection of, uh, of, of the, their mothers uh, and everything that happens until, until death. But if you think about, you know, in the history of the planet, and there's been no uh, peacetime country that has incarcerated more of its citizens uh, than the United States uh, by just raw numbers and, and uh, in terms of proportion. And uh, the infractions and the hyperpunitive uh, way in which this disproportionately affects black people is something that uh, we all should be alarmed. I'm sure King, if he were here, he would be, you know, alarmed and perhaps, you know, deeply disenchanted uh, with that. So I think that there, there are these, you know, uh, these measurements that we can say, hey, these are some good things, uh, black elected officials from 1964. Uh, there, there's, you know, the Voting Rights Act, excuse me, the Civil Rights Act was passed. We have a sevenfold increase of black elected officials. But we also have uh, these, you know, these uh, other concerns that, that we have been dealing with for, for a very long time, like, uh, again, poverty and the sort of uh, the intractable nature of it. But it's, again, uh, decreased significantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we no longer have these laws that codify racism and segregation, but we have institutional racism, uh, where people of color um, are held back from access to quality education because of where they live, or hard to get uh, particular jobs because of where they live and and where they come from. You mentioned mass incarceration. But there is a split in this country. Again, if uh, we think that we're a lot better than we were in the 1960s, but not everyone experiences racism today. So to some, they don't think it exists. Well, I mean, so so I I tell the story that I was born on the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Compton, California when I was in first grade. And I was raised in south central L.A. primarily. And I might not have been called the N-word, but my life was inextricably tied to the effects of institutionalized white supremacy. Although I was born in 1969, right? Those communities were not accidentally sort of created, right? Just by chance, you have this the largest contiguous black community concentrated in this little segment of the state of Illinois, right? This was a, a process that was uh, done by, on a federal, state, and local level with public and private interests and the larger white community to create something like South Central LA or the South South Chicago. And so there, there, in many ways, you have a sort of system that's sort of wound up and you could just let it go and it sort of operates. And so there's no way you can get around that sort of thing. But also when you think of schools, in the LA Unified School District, we had um, schools like Windsor Hills, which, um, you know, Taft High, which was in Windsor Hills, which was, you know, the, perhaps the richest public uh, high school in LA. And then you have schools like, you know, Manual Arts, or uh, Locke in South Central that were, you know, grossly underfunded in comparison with Garfield High in East uh, Los Angeles with a largely Chicano population. So, so there are ways in which, you know, racism created certain spaces where you have huge class disadvantages and advantages, and then we could take away the laws, but those communities are there with institutions still in place that will perpetuate those very mm-hmm. disparities that we lamented, you know, a few years earlier when they were codified in law. So those are the things that we talk about, institutionalized forms. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, when you, no one burned a cross in your yard. You know? But again, if you think about it metaphorically, all of, you know, uh, the South South Chicago was a consequence of, of that sort of the, the, the spirit of burning a cross in someone's yard. Right. And it's, a, it's an affirmation of a sort of mm-hmm. racial uh, subjugation, marginalization, socially, economically and politically. We've got under two minutes. We heard earlier when we were talking about Nat Geo's uh, focus on race that there is this post-racial optimism or this idea that as the demographics change in this country, that racism just goes away. It's not that simple. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I, I struggle over trying to be optimistic. I mean, because cause there, there are a lot of things. And I, as a historian, and I come across people all the time who say, well, you know, we're worse off than we before. I'm like, well, by what measurement? Right. And uh, it turns out that like homicide rate in the last few years, the lowest has been since the 1940s. And everyone's surprised to hear that. And I love saying it because everyone's shocked. We sort of think things are worse. I tell them stories about, you know, the, the teenage birth rate and pregnancy rate for African Americans, lowest on record. Um, and I could go on with all these data that actually show improvement. And, and someone who has studied periods, when I say in 1940, 60% of black women who were employed worked as domestics, right? So when I, when I, when I, I talk about how we are not worse off, I try to explain that. And, I, and so I don't want to be uh, you know, a cynic, but there are clearly examples of in, in the intransigence that we're still struggling against right now, like the institutionalized forms you mentioned, mass incarceration, and again, the rise of these alt-right folks that are trying to erode the progress we've made through these institutional policies. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we have to leave it there, unfortunately. But I want to thank again uh, Dr. Jeffrey Ogbar, professor of history at the University of Connecticut. Thank you for your perspective. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it, Lucy. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Special thanks to WMPR intern Julius Brown. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Learn more about the show at wmpr.org slash where we live. And there's an event at Blueback Square next Tuesday, April 3rd, 6 p.m., honoring Martin Luther King. More on our website.